the second Yale and U.S. College President Speaker Series event of the new academic year. Uh, my name is Liam Rahman. I'm a junior here at Yale and U.S., a major in global affairs. Um, we're very excited to have with us Ms. Olivia Lum, um, the executive chairman and group CEO of HyFlux Limited with us this evening. HyFlux is a leading provider of integrated water management and environmental solutions with operations and projects in Singapore, across Southeast Asia, in China, in India, in the Middle East, and North Africa. This evening, Ms. Lum will be speaking on the Hyflux journey, inspirations from an entrepreneur who dares to dream big. As a business owner myself, co-founder of the Yale US Entrepreneurship Society, and having spent my last two summers working at a clean tech investment fund, paying close attention to the innovations that are happening in the water management industry across the world, I'm particularly excited to learn more about Ms. Lum's journey, her impacts on the industry, and her experiences to date, which I'm sure will resonate with a lot of us given our broad um, and varied entrepreneurial and um, entrepreneurial interests and our interest in innovation more broadly. Let me first introduce our host for this evening, founding president and professor of humanities at Yale and U.S. College, President Pericles Lewis. President Lewis took office on July 1st, 2012. In this short space of time under his leadership, Yale and U.S. College has recruited over 100 faculty members from leading colleges and universities across the world, designed an international curriculum that has attracted widespread attention and interest and enrolled outstanding students from over 40 countries across six continents. Before taking office, President Lewis served as Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Yale University, an expert in literary modernism. He's authored three books on 20th century European literature all published by Cambridge University Press. Please join me in welcoming President Pericles Lewis. Thank you, Liam. It's okay, I got my mic. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see a nice crowd here. I think some of you may be new to Yale and U.S., so we're very pleased to welcome you to our new campus. As Liam says, we've been working on Yale and U.S. for three uh, years now, in the planning stages already five or six years, and it's really a delight to have our own campus at last, uh, with 500 students living here in three residential colleges. We're going to be growing to 1,000 students eventually. Uh, and an event like tonight really um, encapsulates our sense of being what we call a community of learning in the sense that it's an opportunity to bring a noted uh, leader in, in business and society to, uh, to campus to interact with our students and it's also an opportunity to open up our uh, doors to uh, the broader community. So it's great to have, have you all here and we hope to see you again at other events here at, at Yale and US. It's our pleasure to host the noted entrepreneur Olivia Lum. Uh, Ms. Lum grew up in poverty, but uh, performed very well in her studies at Hua Chong Junior College and at NUS. And she uh, tells me that later we'll find out when she got the bug to be an entrepreneur, but it was quite young. Uh, Ms. Lum uh, first worked as a chemist with Glaxo Pharmaceutical, uh, which she left in 1989 to start up Hydrochem Private Limited, the uh, precursor to high flux. Uh, she was known for uh, riding a motorcycle to make deliveries in the early days. I don't know if she still does that or not. Uh, High Flux has since then become uh, uh, known as a, a distinctive and innovative company and has been a water company of the year in the past and has just been recognized for its innovation. Um, she's been managing the group for 26 years now and is the driving force behind HyFlux's growth and business expansion, responsible for policy, strategy formulation, and of course, corporate direction. She's a former nominated member of parliament, a member of the NUS Board of Trustees, and Ms. Lum is currently a member of the Singapore Tianjin Economic and Trade Council, the Singapore Jiangsu Cooperation Council, the Singapore Zhejiang Economic and Trade Council, the Singapore Oman Business Council, and the Singapore Business Federation Council. And as her business expands into Africa, and Mexico, I'm sure she'll be on the Singapore-Africa Trade Council and the Singapore-Mexico Council before too long. She sits on the board, boards of International Enterprise Singapore, Singapore Technologies Engineering Limited, and the Singapore Mediation Center. 
Ms. Lum has received many accolades for her entrepreneurial achievements, including the Nikkei Asia Prize for Regional Growth in 2006, the Ernst Young uh, World Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2011, the Financial Times also, also Arcelor Mittal Boldness and Business Award for Entrepreneurship in 2011. It's great to have her here because I think her uh, work and her innovation uh, speak to several uh, central concerns and principles of Yale and US. Uh, the importance of education, of course, interdisciplinary approaches to problem solving, inter-Asian cooperation, and I think we all have a lot to learn from her. She'll be speaking today on the high flux journey. Uh, please join me in welcoming Olivia Lum. Professor Lewis, and uh, good evening. And I hope that uh, after my speech, I will not discourage you from going into business. Because it's really a journey of trial and tribulation, if you call it. Especially when you started off the business without money, without technology, and without contact. And practically, you have to start the business from ground zero. Um, that is where you know, you, you, you find that sometimes the decision you make might not be the right one. Okay, and um, well, the, I, I, I like to draw cartoon. So every now and then I'll just sketch some cartoon and uh, to encourage my staff to be more entrepreneurial and dream big. So this is a cartoon that I draw in one of the sessions, uh, uh, briefing my staff from going to Africa. You know, it is very difficult to encourage Singaporean to go to Africa. Uh, not South Africa, but Africa like uh, countries like uh, Nigeria, Mozambique, Tanzania. Probably have not even been hearing some of these names. So in order to encourage them, I will go to the whiteboard and sketch something on a board, uh, thinking that they might be quite amused by the idea, so they will go. But not that easy. So, um, I always believe that knowledge is power. So, um, back then, you know, when I was... Uh, by the way, I came from a very little town called Kampa, uh, in the middle of Malaysia. And this small little town, um, you, don't, you don't need to read newspaper, because there's no newspaper. Nobody will bother to distribute newspaper in my small little town. And you don't know anything. So, all you know was, you look around your, your, your village, there were only poverty. And um, generation after generation, people there were living in poverty. Um, the house that I live in has got no water, no electricity. So, but my teacher told me uh, when I was in primary school, she told me, if you want to get out of this poverty, have knowledge, because knowledge is power. So I remember that, so I studied very hard. And um, of course, in a small little town, uh, studying hard is not good enough because don't, there's nobody even offering scholarship. So you got to, if you wanted to go to school, you have to earn your living as a child. And uh, when I was very young, um, nine years old, ten years old, you already hear, um, heard many of my classmates dropping out from school because the family wanted them to be, to be contributing to the livelihood of the family. And very often, they will end up as a, a child labor, working in factory. And I used to be a child labor as well, because I wanted to study. So I told the grandmother who adopted me that, don't worry, I will bring back money, and at the same time, you must allow me to go to school. So after school, I always drop my bag and I rush to make rattan bag. You know, this is not exactly the kind of bag I made, but I couldn't find the old bag anymore. So my secretary found this rattan bag. And every rattan bag that you made, you earn five Malaysian cents. 
and you accumulated uh, kind of like many, many bags and you collect your salary. And I collected my salary uh, one day and it was five ringgit. Five ringgit was a lot of bags. So I remember this five ringgit bag was the first time ever I saw a five ringgit. So I had to um, put it in between my book. And every time I went to school, I would open up, my, open up my book and look at the five ringgit. It was so precious to me. And after a few days of looking at the five dollar note, I gave it to my grandmother because she has to buy um, household things for the family. And the other thing was that uh, other than um, making rattan back, weekend, the shop was closed, so you cannot make bags anymore. So I went to sell fruits. So selling fruits was kind of like very natural things for the, for the children in those days. Because, um, you know, there, there are so many banana trees everywhere. And there are so many mango trees. So you just pluck those banana tree, bananas and the mangoes and you sell along the street. So, in a way, a lot of people ask me, was it your real inspiration to do business after your um, university degree or after you worked? I say probably at a young age. Because at a young age, comparing making red tan and selling fruits, which are easier? Which, which one is easier? Of course, selling fruits, because you just sit along the roadside. And then you just keep calling people to buy your fruits. Instead of squatting down in the factory floors, and one by one, you've got to weave your bags. So I, at a very young age, I told myself, I'm going to be a businesswoman because selling is so easy. As long as you sell good banana and good mango, there will always be people buying from you. And besides, there's, the, the cost is zero because you pluck from the trees. So no cost and then you get revenue. It's not bad. So all goes down to bottom line. So anyway, um, after I finished my LCE, which is a... Uh, Form 3 uh, in Malaysia, I got my LC results. It was quite pretty good results. And one day, my principal came to talk to me very seriously. And rarely you wanted to meet your principal, right? When your principal call you, you kind of, you know, feel that, well, there must be something serious. And he told me, don't stay in this town. Go to Kuala Lumpur or Singapore. And I thought it was a good idea. Um, what he, meant, he, he, he really meant was, get out of this little space. There's no future for you. You better go to KL or Singapore. Maybe he doesn't like my face or whatever, but I thought that, you know, maybe it's a good idea. So I, I decided to went, came to Singapore because I have got a lot of neighbours who work as a construction workers in Singapore then. And of course, you know, um, those were the history. I worked in Singapore as part-time while I was uh, pursuing my education here. I entered Hua Chong and later on NUS. So NUS is very dear to me. And after NUS, I was very lucky. Um, I graduated in 1986 and that was a financial year, crisis year. I, but I managed to enter Glexo, kind of like through back doors. Don't laugh. <laughs> because, you know, when you had no job, it was very terrible. And the whole class hadn't got a job. And I got it through my back door. You know why? Because my professor strongly recommended me. And my professor has um, um, a student who was the manager in the Glexo. And he highly recommended me to him. So I, I got it through back door. Anyway, I was very happy working there for three and a half years. And, uh, and within the three and a half years, I did not forget what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a businesswoman. Working as a chemist, you are always working within the four walls. You, 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 you didn't get any contact with outside world. Every day you came to the lab and you do your analysis and so on. So it was quite a, uh, I would say, I cannot say it's a boring job, but it is not what I want in life. So one day, I, you know, I chanced upon 
an incident that have actually totally changed my life. I was tasked to take charge of the wastewater. In pharmaceutical companies, one of the things that they produce most, other than drugs, is wastewater because they use all kinds of chemicals to produce drugs. And Glaxo is a very reputable company and uh, they spend a lot of money treating the waste. Then I look around, Singapore, Asia, no company is going to do that. A lot of smaller companies, local companies, they, they, they thought of wastewater as a, a cost to their business. Why would they want to treat the waste? So they would just dump it into the river. So, so during that time, I went to see uh, Jakarta River and the rivers in, in Malaysia and other parts in Asia. Everybody keep dumping the waste into the river. So I told myself, it must be a, a sunrise business. Because as a chemist, I know that when you pollute the river, it takes a long, long time to clean it up. And also, if you don't clean up the river, over time, you have no clean, good, clean water to drink. And it's a disaster for Asian people. So I told myself, I could do something. Somebody has to do this dirty job. And, you know, being so young, at the age of 27 years old, I was full of inspiration and full of ideas, dreams. And number one, I want to do my business. Number two, I want to save the world. Very naive. So I, I, one day I walked up to my boss. My boss happened to be a British um, expatriate in Singapore. And I told him that I'm going to resign. Then he said, why do you want to resign? You Singaporean, always job hop. He scolded me. I said, no, 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 no. Number one, I'm, I was not Singaporean then, so I'm not Singaporean. <laughs> Secondly, I'm not job hopping. I love the job here, but I have even a greater passion. I wanted to be a businesswoman. So he thought, oh, okay, maybe you, you have a rich family, or your family is in business, or, you know, how do you, how do you, conjure up this idea of doing business. So I told him, no, no. I think I wanted to be a water treatment company because I think I need to clean up the rivers in, in the whole of Asia. There's a lot of big problems coming. Then he told me, if you have no money, no contact, and uh, no technology, how are you going to start this business? They said that. So I told him, precisely, because I don't have all this, I need to resign. So he still didn't quite understand. What I was trying to tell him was, I needed to resign because I needed to, time to do research into this business. Otherwise, I had no time. So in the end, I resigned from a cozy job. Um, but when I resigned, I had no money. So I had to sell away my little house and a little car and uh, get collected about $20,000 because I got to pay back some loan. And with the $20,000, I thought it was a lot of money for me to start the business. But of course, I was proven wrong. By the time I rented a HDB office and they charged me three months deposit, 10000 gone. So I was left with $10,000. And because there was no car, so I had to buy a little motorbike to get around. So those were the early startup. And when I was talking about living a second time comfort zone, I really had to sell everything away. And kind of like you have no way to, or you can't, fail anymore. If you fail, you will fail with even the $20,000 and you lost a good job. But of course, I can go back and become a chemist again. But this is not what I wanted to do. I cannot leave my passion twice, I told myself. So I told myself, no matter how difficult it was, I need to persevere. So that, that building on the, on the, you know, right-hand corner was the first little office that I rented from HDB. 
and of course, subsequently, you know, our company grew bigger and bigger, and now we could afford a building. As the early years, being an entrepreneur, probably I faced a lot of challenges as everybody else, because a lot of people ask me, as a woman, do you face difficulty being an entrepreneur? I say, I don't think it's just being a woman. Maybe men also equally facing a lot of problems. As long as you, have, you are startup companies, you face a lot of problems because you have no track record, people, people don't trust you, and you don't quite understand the business world because as a startup, you're very naive. You can enter into the business, you thought that this is a sunrise business, but it wasn't a sunrise business. You could discover it and you could overcome a lot of difficulties. So in the beginning, when I first started out as a small little company, nobody trusted me because initially I, I wanted to do a service for some companies. I said, I can analyze your ways, I can give you some consultancy and so on, but nobody wanted to talk to me. And in the end, I approached some of these very big multinational water treatment companies and walk up to them and say, why don't you engage me as your agent? When I, sold, when I manage to sell the product, I will, I will take some commission from you. So some of the multinational companies say, well, there's no, no loss. They are not paying me until I sell something for them. So I carry some of the multinational water treatment products and I started to peddle in Singapore. But Singaporeans are very brand conscious. The moment they look at Tampines Industrial Park, my first office, they already know you're a small little startup. So I think address is very important. <laughs> so they didn't want to give me any business. So in the end, I had to go across Malaysia. When I go across Malaysia, I carry a card Singapore. It's a multinational company. And I had to go to Indonesia, who are even more branded because I'm from Singapore, flying over to Indonesia. So I started selling my products in Malaysia and Singapore. And no joke, I started really getting a lot of business that, that is able to keep me afloat. And after a couple of years, I told myself, no, I cannot be just an agent. I wanted to produce my own product how to produce your own product. You are just an agent, right? You, whatever money you earn, you earn very little bit. I have, I have not been paying my own salary for many years. So where do I eat? This is a sole proprietor business. Whatever I have, maybe part of it, pay for my lunch and dinner and pay for my rental and the rest, not much left. Then how can I do a Expand this business, just like in any other startup business. You've got to worry about rental, you've got to worry about salary, you've got to worry about the market. How are you going to sell to pay the next month's rental? It's always in my mind. Always, every day, keep thinking. But, you know, one of the ways of overcoming it is that, I mean, I'm not suggesting that this definitely 100% will work. You, instead of working 10 hours, you work 14 hours. So in other words, you are the strategist, you are the sales manager, you are the logistic delivery person, you are the accounts person, and you are the receptionist. So you bow everything, bow ge liao. What it means is you are one person, but you do multiple tasks. So you don't have to employ people first. Cut cost. So early in the morning, I will wake up at 5 a.m. Because that time, Malaysia hasn't got a highway yet. So, you know, no highway. You, you wanted to go to Batu Pahat, Moa. This is where all the factories were situated. You got to cut through all the traffic jam and so on. So you better woke up early. So I will go early in the morning to take order. Or to visit customer. Then, when I come back to Singapore, it's already a late afternoon. Then you got to do packing for the next delivery. And then you got to 
uh, work with a logistic company in some of the larger components you got to ship. And at night, you got to sit down and do typing, do letters, do whatever thing. Then until very late, you got to do a lot of uh, store keeping as well, you know. So you pound everything. So you work 14 hours every day. But if there's a still successes, it's not too bad. So it has been ongoing for so many years. Until such time, I say enough is enough. I'm not going to be an agent. I want to be a manufacturer and I want to be a technology company. So I came back to NUS. I talked to my professor. How can you help me? to be a technology company. In those times, there were a lot of this technology collaboration between industries and, and the university. So I started from there, uh, working together with the university, and every single sense that I earned, I plowed into the pilot, pilot plant. And I built many, many pilot plants, and I put all these pilot plants into a lot of Singapore companies, because they are the very brand conscious ones. And besides, they don't even trust you because you're so small. So you have to build a pilot plant and test free for them. So I tested free for them for six months. When they're happy, they buy from me. So in the end, because in Singapore, no company wants to do this kind of dirty job. Number one, is very smelly. Number two, it's very difficult under hot sun. You've got to carry out the waste treatment and demonstrating to the customer. And you've got to run it, right? You cannot allow it to be run by the customer. Customer wouldn't run for it. You've got to run. You've got to operate the, the pilot plant under hot sun. So later on, it was very tough for me. So I employed one technician. So, you know, all the systems, when I built, I asked a third party to build for me. But I wanted to have the skill, the company's capability within in-house to be able to build this system. So in the end, I get I managed to employ one technician, and the technician, of course, good technician would not work for a small company, like, you know. I'm not saying that he's no good, but not that level, like, you know, that you You know what I mean, no? <laughs> it's just like, you guys, right, you must be quite intelligent to enter this college, right? You are not, I mean, okay, I don't want to say anymore. <laughs> so, in the end, one day, I saw how he, welded some pipes and uh, I was not a welder, I was only a chemist. But no matter what, I look at the weld joint, it's like a beehive, cannot be good, right? But he told me it's very good. So in the end, I was a little bit um, upset with the work that, you know, the technician has been doing. I enrolled myself in today's ITE equivalent to learn welding and to learn piping. So I got a, I got a cert, you know, I, I, I got to study at night and do, learn how to do welding. Then when I came back, I got to teach my technician how to do a good welding joint. So this is the, how, you know, I survived in the growing years. And of course, you know, um, Singapore is a very small market. In early on, I identified that Singapore is only 5 million people. How, how many job opportunity or the project opportunity that I can get from Singapore? So I've decided that maybe I should go far, far away. I went to Philippines, I went to Thailand, I went to uh, a few other places like Indonesia in 1993-94. And I found that everywhere else in Asian or ASEAN, was booming with economy. A lot of my competitors were already there. And um, it was not possible for me to, um, to compete with them because they, are, they were so grounded in all this country already. So I went to China. And if you still remember, 1989 was a Tiananmen incident. And um, that incident has discouraged a lot of um, foreign companies entering China. But I've decided to enter there. Number one, I told myself, at least I can speak Chinese. I look like Chinese. Third, I think when you go to a place with a 1.3 billion population, it can't go wrong. Everybody needs to drink water, so it can't go wrong. And at the same time, I told myself that if you go to a country where nobody else wanted to go, 
you probably will be welcome. So of course, some of these analyses, I got it right. I was so welcome. They all welcomed me like open arm. Everybody wanted to, to, to welcome me, but not to give job to me. They want job from me. So in the end, you know, of course, I almost bankrupted the company because it was so tough in China. Uh, 1994, 95, 96, three years, almost bankrupted the companies because number one, it was a very tough market. China was at the early stage. Um, people don't care about waste treatment or water treatment. People only care about economic progress. So, 1990, at the end, kind of like end 1996, suddenly there was an influx of a lot of foreigners, foreign company MNC in China. And I seized the opportunity uh, talking to a lot of these MNC and provide this service to them. Because a lot of MNC didn't want to violate laws, they wanted to treat their, their wastewater. So I seized the opportunity at the right time when I haven't got any competitors. And I could speak Chinese and English, so therefore, you know, this, this, uh, um, uh, this capability allows me to be a favourite amongst all the MNC working in China. So I built many, many water treatment plants in China. Come 1997, a big financial crisis. And places like Thailand, the ASEAN region were totally affected. Even Korea were affected. But in China, it was okay. China, because the economy was closed, renminbi was uh, all well protected. They, don't have, they didn't have currency crisis. So I was doing very well in China as well as in Singapore. So both sides, I was doing quite well. And uh, in 1998, my banker called me up and asked me, how come you are doing so well? Every of your competitors are all either going into receivership or needed to borrow more money to survive. And how come you are doing so well? Because I only have one bank. So the banker can see all my, account, my, my money in the bank. And said, you didn't even come to ask for, to, to borrow money. Then how come you're doing so well? I say, because number one, I'm in Singapore and China, two places. In this financial crisis, I was quite safe. Number two, when everybody else was in great difficulty, you become champion. Because it's just like you send a dog for championship. If your dog is the only one, they win champion. It's the same. So therefore, you know, this situation helped me a lot. So everybody, when the economy is slowly, slowly improving, I was the only one left in Singapore, kind of like dominant enough to do all the big job. And that time, also happened that Singapore wanted to have a water conservation, um, encouraging all the companies to recycle water. So uh, I, I did a lot of water recycling in Singapore for Siemens, for Toshiba, for all the big MNC in Singapore. And of course, you know, this is a China plant. I wanted to show you one, I mean, of course, these are the pictures. I wanted to show you something very significant. I did the first water big scale recycling plant for Brit Park. So this is a, this is a mouse zone, uh, water recycling in a bird park. And I must tell you the story behind. How come they, they can adopt my techno technology and they like my technology? And subsequently, of course later on, led to we winning new water plant. Um, I went to the bird park. This is the then CEO of bird park. And I told him that I can help you to recycle water for your bird. And that time, they brought in some very, very expensive Empress Penguin. Very, very precious. But they need, you know, Penguin needed a lot of water, fresh water. So PUP told them that we cannot afford to give you so much water. If you want, you recycle water. And so, because there was no company approaching him, I approached him. I said, can I recycle water for your Penguin? He said, will you kill my Penguin? I say, okay, I demonstrate to you first, I drink first. So I drink myself first. Then he saw that I'm, I was still surviving. 
So he believed that, you know, maybe perhaps this water can be for bank cream. And until today, they're still using this recycling water. So that was a big milestone for us, that we were able to recycle water for such a big, uh, big quantity. And of course, you know, another big milestone, of course, is that because the bank wanted to know how did I manage to overcome all the obstacles, gone through the financial crisis, and also became so strong. So they wanted to IPO, Hyfax. Uh, in the beginning, it was called Hydrochem. And the banker told me, Hydrochem, this name is too long. And also, somewhere, somewhere in the world, there was some company also called Hydrochem. Can you change your name? So being a chemist, very simple. How does Hyfax come about? Membrane has got flux called flow. And if your membrane is efficient, you need to have very high flux, high flow. So high flux is how it come about. <laughs> and uh, of course, as I said earlier, you know, all the earlier works paved the way for me to win the first new water plant, and of course the second new water plant as well. And subsequently, we also win uh, the first ever uh, desalination plant for Singapore. And also this plant was the largest desalination plant in those times uh, in the world. And um, I still remember when I got this project, um, the government was very worried because my company was only 50, 50, worth about 50 over million dollar company. This project is 200 million dollar company. Who would trust you? to deliver a project of 200 million, kind of like three, four times of your net worth. So it was a long story, of course, you know. First, I got to go and have coffee with the chairman of the bank. Second, I got to have coffee with the chairman of PUB. I got to convince them that, you know, I'm able to do that because I've been doing a lot of desalination smaller system for the nearby country. And I also did many recycling plants. So membrane plants to us, we were the only companies that put in so much R&D effort and research into membrane plants. So I could explain to them that building a big plant is like, okay, you know how to build one fridge. Can you build 1,000 fridges? You can. And the advantage of membrane is that it's like modular. You can stack them together. So they were quite quite convinced, but they're still not convinced that, you know, I have the money to build $200 million plant. So both chairmen talk, 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 you know. So in the end, I suggested, or rather that, you know, they also quite agree. Maybe they suggested, I, I can't remember who suggested it first. I say, very simple. I will undertake this job, and if I fail, PUB can always take over. Isn't it? But, in the event that uh, I could not deliver the job, I lost every single cent. That means you can see the commitment that I have for this project. I have a lot of experience, but of course, financially, maybe I'm not large enough to do such a job. But the moment, if you can see the kind of commitment from a single company like this, and after all, there's no risk. The moment that we fail, PUB can always take over and continue with the projects. Kind of to, I, I didn't know whether they were convinced or not, but anyway, I got the project. <laughs> and of course, you know, we emphasize a lot on innovation. And, you know, I, I was always very grateful with the kind of basic education I had in the university. Because way before, uh, before I attended university, I actually told myself that if I wanted to do business, I don't need a new degree. I told myself, but somehow, some friends convinced me that, okay, you like to do business, at least your business card has got BSEC. Go and study. So I ended up as a chemist. And at least I appreciated the time when I spent in a university, and I appreciated a lot of innovation and research part of it. So when, I, when my company getting bigger and bigger, I keep emphasizing on having great innovation in our company. So we built many, many first-time plant. Well, for, for your information, we're quite happy that we got the first 
waste to energy, which is an incineration plant in Singapore, and which is the largest in the world and the most efficient in the world. Only yesterday. <laughs> and there was, of course, there was about 760 million. This is quite a big plant. And so, you know, over the years, I tried to build core capabilities in high flux. I emphasize on R&D, I emphasize on internal capabilities and seamless integrations from R&D all the way to EPC and O&M. And doing all this large project, one thing is very clear. You've got to be able to have a strong financial platform. So a lot of people say that, hey, you're not a financial person, you're not this and that. But I think, you know, being a, a, a business person, the most important uh, factor is really to join all the dots together. You might not be um, expert in all fields, but if you are able to join all the dots together, you are able to leverage on experts. You must be able to convince them to accept your idea. And you have all. You might not be a strong mechanical guy, you may not be an operation guy, but you got to make sure that these people are on your team. Buy your idea and they will produce wonderfully. So my job is actually to extract as much as talents in a person that they, sometimes they don't even know themselves. And today, of course, these are the world map that we have presence in. Uh, this world map, we, we, we did it over the last um, kind of like 15 years since we listed in 2001. So um, from 2001 until today, we have built more than 1,000 plants all over the world. That is why when President Louis asked me to give a speech, I kind of hesitated a while. Because sometimes when I was required to travel last minute, then I might, might miss giving a lecture like this, you know. So uh, anyway, I managed to make it, and, but I, I could not join him for dinner. And that's why after this session, I had to rush to airport. So it, it, it just, unless you have this passion, I think a lot of people will look at me, Olivia, why do you want to do all this thing? Why do you want to travel from one place to another? And worse still, why do you want to choose places like Africa? I always have this, uh, what they call it, especially now, that uh, you know, I've been so successful after going through the last 20 years. I feel that it is the emerging market that needed my service most. And if I could produce water, produce renewable energy for all these people, I think this is a very worthwhile business. Not just to make money alone, but I think it's a worthwhile business to benefit mankind. Anyway, again, this is my big dream. So I have gone to uh, Africa, I have gone to even all the way to Latin America. And again, I ended up with these slides. I draw a boat um, to encourage people who wanted to enter the journey of entrepreneurship. Uh, you look at the wave, I draw a big wave. And this is like a company with all the different people on the boat. And if you expect the boat to be sailing all the time on the smooth water, I think you're lying yourself, lying to yourself. It is not true. Uh, running a business is, um, what I call it, um, it is like on a boat where you do not know which day you're going to meet with a big storm. So you've got to be, be, pre be prepared. You may warm it along the way. You have to take the challenge. But at the end of the day, you have a, a, a land full of honey and milk. So this is your vision. So you've got to sail towards this land of milk and honey. OK, thank you very much. I don't know whether I should stay here. I think I suppose uh, I need to stay here with uh, President Lewis. Would you like to have a seat? OK, thank you.
Ms. Lum, that was really inspiring. Thank you very much. It's amazing to see the way that this uh, company, that you found a product that's of such great importance today and that you built the company from the motorbikes and the small office and the HDB up until this wonderful map that you showed us of how you're transforming water and, and energy use around the world. So th thank you very much for you. being with us. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, we'd like to get you on the microphone, if you don't mind. So if you could just come down the aisles to the mics at the um, front. And um, please introduce yourself uh, before you ask, ask the question. So please come down. I'll maybe ask the first question while people are thinking about what they've, or come on down. Oh, you've got that mic. OK, go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks so much for your speech, Olivia. It was very inspiring. I'm a junior at Yale and US environmental studies major. So uh, on Monday, I actually hosted a conference to bridge Southeast Asia and Latin America. And a Mexican ambassador actually lauded High Flux as a very successful Singaporean company that's um, launched into Latin America. Um, my question to you really is, um, how does a small SME grow and be able to bridge various obstacles to, um, to work on inter-regional um, connections and development in helping companies to expand overseas. So my question really is, in, in the absence of any sort of financial or um, large presence, how can we help SMEs to expand like yourself? Mm. Um, you always find that uh, um, a lot of SME always get stuck at a certain stage and they're not able to go beyond um, that, that, um, their, their boundary. I think one of the uh, things that I realized that, you know, and I've been studying when I was a very small company, I've been studying how then I can become bigger companies. And I think as long as you have the desire to become big company, you will try to find uh, what would suit your companies and what would then help your companies to become bigger. Of course, you know, you, you need to talk to people, you need to kind of like brainstorm with a lot of your mentor, but at the end of it, you have to make the decision yourself. And uh, one of the critical uh, factors that you want to go big is your talent pool. A lot of SME that I noticed that you're not able to get beyond what you can get was that, I mean, nothing wrong with uh, some of them. They also go very big. But uh, many a time, I was not, I'm, here I'm not trying to criticize or comment on some of the way that they do things. But uh, many a time, I found that uh, SME always rope in a lot of their family members. And, well, family members, you cannot sack them, you cannot scold them. <laughs> You're going to have a trouble at home, right? And, you know? And, and because if you have uh, too many family members in your company, you will not be able to really attract the real talents. Because the talents wanted to join your company to feel the, the progressiveness in your company and not to be involved in family quarrel sometimes or tension or whatever. So this is one of the aspects that I saw. But of course, I do see a lot of successful family business. Um, but many of them get stuck at a certain stage was because of the fact that they, was not able, they were not able to attract the real talents to come and help them to grow. Now secondly is that when you you know, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. If you're small, nobody wants to join you. And uh, when I was having a very small company, I still remember the first time I employed a clerical assistant, helping me to, take, to become a receptionist. Because I can't, can't be all the time being a receptionist, right? So I was thinking of getting a clerical assistant. I have advertised, of course, my advertisement is very small to save cost. <laughs> and it was so difficult to even get one person calling me for the job. So one day, I managed to convince one person to come for the interview. I had to serve her tea. I was so frightened that, you know, even this would not take my job. So you, you can imagine that when, a, when you are small, even a clerical assistant don't want to, to, to work for you. A technician who came here and they, they, they just try to push it you. So it was very difficult to grow the company. So in the end, I had no choice. 
uh, when my company was going a little bit into the third year or fourth year, I had to approach some of my friends. Because most of my friends are either working as doctors, dentists, teachers, and many other professions in my university. And certainly, they would not want to work for my, this small little company. So I had to wait for an opportunity time when they really get fed out of their job, <laughs> please try. <laughs> and I managed to attract a few of my classmates to help out. I said, you don't work for life for me. Just help me with this transition. Because this transition is very important for me to become bigger. And at the same time, you can get away from your job, so you feel more refreshing joining an entrepreneur to do business. Quite a good idea, right? I mean, not, I mean, I cannot convince a doctor to work for me, right? So you know how? I, I do have a classmate who is a doc, medical doctor to join me in the beginning. So you know how I convince her? I say, instead of treating uh, patient, why don't you treat water? <laughs> you treat patient, patient complain. Water will not complain. <laughs> so of course, you know, in the end, she managed to help me for a couple of years. So this is how, you know, I grew my company. I feel that uh, you know, SME, they need to understand their constraint. Good, thanks. Could people come down to the mics? It'll be easier to... Thank you. Stan, why don't you go ahead? Hi, thank you for this uh, inspiring talk. Uh, my name is Stan. I'm a chemistry professor here. So you skimmed a lot on the chemistry part, so I'm not going to ask you for formula or membrane sizes mm -hmm. and polymers and all that. Um, the question I have, so you, earlier you talked about, you know, the free fruit that you could pick and then sell. And later in your talk, I found maybe a similarity of, you know, getting to university and, you know, being able to use a place like Singapore as a launching pad for future ideas. So I'm wondering, um, you know, what, is, what are your thoughts on the responsibility of medium and even large companies to the communities of learning around the world that are actually can be, that can serve as launch pads. Because, so I'm from Bulgaria originally, and like one thing that we're concerned about is this brain drain. So I have come to Singapore, and by not teaching, let's say in Bulgaria, I cannot educate the next generation. So it becomes this lopsided world of highly developed centers, and the rest is, for lack of a better word, Africa, right? Okay, like nobody wants to go there. So how do, we, how do we change that landscape? And like, what role do you think larger companies or even small players can do in that environment? Yeah. Well, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, depending on what, uh, what you wanted to propagate, uh, for my business, I can only share from my business because I know my business pretty well in that sense that if I wanted to reach out to a country where they see in need. I think uh, you're talking about uh, propagating uh, either your technology or how good you are or you know, how you can help the, these people. I, I think it is very important that you, know, you, must be, you must not lose heart. You have to kind of like uh, invest in your time and effort and money, of course, you know, to do that. And there are of course many ways of doing so. And like for example, the first time uh, we entered Middle East, I realized my mistake because I went alone. Being a woman, it was very difficult because you're not kind of like uh, well received in that country. Um, nothing wrong, but it, it was their culture. So it is not accepted. So in the end, uh, all my business development hate has to be male. Sorry, you know, woman, you know, you can't fit the bill of being a business development hate in, say, Saudi, in the UAE, or Qatar, or Oman. It is not so appropriate culturally. But you've got to spend time and money as well to, to be able to do that. Um, there's no shortcut. Maybe today, multimedia probably can help you a little bit here and there, unless your message is so outstanding, which I always say that, you know, I mean, 
uh, I cannot be one in a million like uh, Apple. They have a fantastic product. But you still need to bring your message across, your product across, your ideas across. So you still have to go by the traditional hard way. You know, because multimedia now today is flooded with so many messages. Unless your message is so outstanding, right? And I always tell myself I'm not that intelligent. Mm -hmm. I think better do the normal things that other people do. Just work a little bit harder, perceive it a little bit more. I think I'll be able to get there. So you said a very interesting thing earlier about the fact that when people ask you as a woman, does that affect your entrepreneurship? And you said, well, any person starting out, woman or man, would have a challenge. But then in your story about the Middle East, it seemed like there were different challenges to being a woman there. So I wanted to ask, in the 20-some years that you've been developing, has the, has the, uh, the space for women entrepreneurs become different, do you think? Has it improved or is it staying the same? And do you find that working internationally, that there are extra challenges there to being a woman outside the one that you've already yeah. mentioned? Yeah, I think that certainly there's always a challenge, whether it's men or women. Of course, maybe women, particularly in a business of, um, I would call this engineering world, mm -hmm. right? And it's normally dominated by men. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine how many women would like to uh, work under the hot sun in mm -hmm. the, analyzing the wastewater in front mm -hmm. of the customers? Um, I mean, I got to always prepare, you know, later on. I'll, I mean, going to that kind of places do have some certain challenges for women. Mm -hmm. I always carry along with me. The most important thing is a perfume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no joke, because I got to run a, a few things, right? I got to go to wastewater treatment plant later and I got to enter the office to see the manager, mm -hmm. right? So I first have to spray myself a little mm -hmm. bit nicer first before <laughs> seeing the manager. But I think having said that, um, being young also has a disadvantage. But of course, you know, depending on what kind of business you are doing, this is a very hard, hard engineering kind of business. People are all talking about proven technology. Uh, you know, you're talking about bolts and nuts and piping and, you know, membranes and so on. These are all very hard engineering. So age comes as a disadvantage mm -hmm. if you are too young. Um, I remember that uh, when, when I first went to China in 1994, um, I was very young then, you know. Not that I look very old today. <laughs> and you still look very young. But 20 years ago, I was very young. Mm -hmm. And it's like a schoolgirl. In, in fact, uh, one of the guys in China asked me, did you just graduate from uh, school? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that kind of a question, you can kind of like immediately feel it already. And also, when you set up a company in China, I couldn't understand the culture because in China, you cannot employ any people who are between uh, 30 to maybe 60 because these are the group of people that will stay because it's a communist country, they stay in their company. They, they needed it like an iron rice bowl. Mm -hmm. They will never resign, join a small company or even a foreign company, even a big company, they will not join you. Mm. And I didn't know that. So in the end, I ended up employing all the young graduates in my company. So one day, one of the potential customers came to see me and look around in my office and say, oh, you're a company of Boy Scouts and Girl Guides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and plus the fact that I was very young. So it was really like, you know, a small little children company and doing hard engineering, can you imagine? <laughs> so in the end, I realized that. So I look for a candidate who is above 65 years old. Hmm. <laughs> because they're already retired. Get the balance. Back. It's a balance. Yeah. So in the end, I got a 65-year-old as my GM, general mm -hmm. manager. Looks very dignified. <laughs> it's a White very hair. good system. Very good system. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in the end, I solved some of this problem. So anyway, this, this is a come of challenges. And, and to answer your question, whether it's improved, I suppose it depends on what kind of business. But in Singapore, certainly entrepreneurship has improved a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you don't get the kind of uh, um, negative comment from people that, oh, why, why do you want to become an entrepreneur? Is it that you can't find a job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. That was the kind of a comment that uh, I had from so many people. You couldn't find a job, that's why you end up in a, as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And one of my dentist friends, I still remember um, 
talking to me, I said, why did, especially in the beginning, you, you know, you, you have really gone through hardship, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you had no money to buy lunch. Mm -hmm. So you kind of tumpang some of your classmates and get your classmate to buy you a good meal. And that is where you hear all the comments and lessons. And she will, co she will comment that, why do you want to end up yourself like this? Mm -hmm. Why can't you become a stockbroker? Mm -hmm. It's easier to sit in the aircon, you know, just call a few clients, you know. <laughs> as long as you help the customer make money, they like you very much. So, so, but the thing is, she was a dentist. Booming business, but I say that even though booming business, your business is like Chakui Tiao, one boat at a time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a business that's scalability. Mm -hmm. I do not need to do one by one. But of course, today I prove her right, wrong. I prove, her, I prove myself right. Uh, but I mean, nothing wrong with being dentist. It was because she commented so heavily on me that, you know, <laughs> keep asking me to become a stockbroker. That's how, you know, I, I replied her. But anyway, it, it was a. Uh, much easier now. Great. I think there's time for one more question. Okay, Michael. Uh, Olivia, uh, I'm Michael Kwa, you know me. I'm, I'm a professor of chemical engineering in NUS. Uh, and I'm over 65, so I have to ask a dignified question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've known you for a long time, and when we were both in Membranes and I was in DuPont, uh, I was very impressed that you, as a small company, made the transition up the value chain into being an EPC, which meant, really meant that you were outside what uh, the traditional companies would call their core strength. So just for an example, I was in DuPont in Membranes. When we had the chance, this is DuPont now, a big company, to move up the value chain to value added to being an EPC and that time with national power in the UK, even DuPont chickened up. So my point, and so now DuPont is no longer in membranes. The point I want to ask you is, when you had to get out from such a severe uh, comfort zone, from being a membrane company to now being an EPC where you're building plants, what gave you the guts? Now, if I were less dignified, I would have asked you, what gave you the gonads <laughs> to move into an EPC? Thank you. Well, where appropriate questions. In fact, <laughs> in fact, uh, I, you know, when I run a, a company, when I first started a business, I always wanted to do big. Also, I, I like to dream big. You know, you don't dream big, uh, you know. There's no fun in running a small company all the time. And when you want to do something, you, you, you meet with a lot of obstacles when you're small. When you're bigger, you have less obstacles. When you're very big, you can decide on your own fate. So I look at being an equipment or membrane supplier as a very limited way of doing business because you have to, uh, you, you are at the mercy of the EPC company. You're subcon. You're not even subcon, you're sub subcon. <laughs> you know? So you're very small in the value chain. So can you imagine that to sell your thing, you've got to go through so many levels. So I, want, I decided one day that I'm going to control my own fate. So I make sure that I will advance myself into EPC. But of course, you need the respective talent. You need a totally different talent pool of people. People who make membrane cannot be an EPC guy because these are involving multidisciplinary kind of engineering, not just chemical engineering, but multidisciplinary way. So you just want to join all the dots together. You identify who you are lacking. You know, you just keep employing people who can join all the dots together. And of course, being a leader, you got to all the time um, kind of like encourage them and essentially is to kind of like uh, uh, convince them to share your vision. It's like, you know, every time I talk to them, it's like telling them to come into the pirate ship because <laughs> when they enter the pirate ship, they cannot get down anymore. <laughs> so you've got to excite them to come to the pirate ship. So, you know, joining the dots together is very critical. And then, 
being an EPC also not easy because you are, you'll be at the mercy of the owner. So now I become the owner. So I do PPP project where I only have one customer. I don't have multiple customers. I deal only one customer, which is the government. I do not want to be sub, 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 sub. Mm -hmm. So I deal directly with the government. I say I will invest my money to build this whole plant. So this is called build, own, operate and transfer. So I, I'm now involved in many, many build, own, operate plant. The way to get the financing, after becoming an EPC, you've got the experience. And you've got to have a certain breakthrough. So the first PPP project was the Sing Spring Desalination Plant, which cost me about $200 million when the company was only $15 million. And anyway, I already told you, eventually, they were so convinced because when you come to investment, I dare to invest my whole wealth into it. So everybody should be convinced that with such a commitment and with such a track record, I should be given a chance. And I was given a chance and I never disappoint anybody. <laughs> and so, of course, I also built the second desalination plant, which was just uh, completed uh, two, three years ago. And globally, today, um, we are quite happy to let you know that in terms of a developer of a desalination, we're number one today mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, a little bit humble, but uh, mm -hmm. yes, I think uh, I, I'm not trying to uh, say what, but I think it takes a strategic move to get to where mm -hmm. we are today. Well, Ms. Lum, sorry, Ms. Lum has to get to the airport, so I just yes. want to, to say thank you and um, thank you. Uh, a remarkable story. Congratulations, thank and thank you so much for gracing our, our college. And I think Liam's going to say a few words. Just a few words to say thank you on behalf of the um, community students and faculty and staff at Yale and US College for joining us. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening, and we hope you join us for more President Speaker Series events in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.